Receptive avoidance, where the person's avoiding exercise, caffeine, even having sex, which elevates heart rate. You don't hear about a distraction. People with um, panic avoid uh, changing certain activities, watching TV, uh, turning the radio up, or, or conversing. I'm sorry, they, they do those things to try to distract themselves when they notice themselves having uh, the, what might be the beginning of a panic attack. And they engage in other kinds of safety behaviors, having a companion, a safe person, anxiety medications, carrying a cell phone around at all times in case I have to call my doctor or my, my loved one to come and get me, uh, drinking water, clothing, uh, praying, religious symbols, all sorts of things that they think are going to keep them alive if they should have a panic attack. So it turns out, well, as I said, ag agoraphobia, um, you know, well, I'll just give you the answer straight up. I think no. Agoraphobia cannot exist without panic disorder. Agoraphobia, I think, is completely linked uh, to panic. And, and I think it's a pity that the DSM uh, doesn't do more to, to uh, link it with panic and also link these other, can, these other behaviors that are just as important from a functional standpoint uh, with panic disorder. So let's return to uh, the hoarding issue that we talked about before. Hoarding, actually, if you read the, the DSM, hoarding is actually not at all mentioned in the DSM in the OCD chapter. Um, it's mentioned in the Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder chapter, and it's mentioned in, I think, one of the Psychotic Disorder chapters. Um, but it's not mentioned as a diagnostic criteria or even anywhere in the section on, on OCD. And it wasn't until the 1980s, you know, so how did hoarding get lumped into OCD? In the 1980s, uh, there were some epidemiologic studies that, that happened, and uh, someone started to lump hoarding in with OCD, and it actually got included on one of the major checklists that we use now in the field called the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive uh, Symptom Checklist, and there's hoarding there. And the, the checklist was developed to try to be a, a catch-all, try to be a, a, um, uh, a, a complete list of all different kinds of obsessions and compulsions. There are actually a lot of things that aren't OCD. Skin picking is on the, the, the checklist, and um, uh, other, uh, uh, I think, uh, self-injurious behaviors on the checklist, which is an OCD, but so is hoarding. And so now there are many, many measures that include hoarding, uh, and it's just become kind of uh, part of, of OCD. However, it's kind of always been a matter of debate uh, over how strongly it's been uh, related to, to OCD. <coughs> so our group uh, at North Carolina has actually done uh, some studies to, to try to shed some light on this, to look at it. And in this particular study, we compared large groups of people with OCD to large groups of people with other anxiety disorders. The anxiety control group had a, a smattering of different disorders, panic disorder, social phobia, um, specific phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then also uh, college students. And we compared them on the OCIR. This is the Obsessive Compulsive Inventory Revised. It's an 18-item measure, and it has subscales that look at the different uh, sorts of OCD symptoms, checking, washing, obsessing. This neutralizing scale is actually not, not valid, so we're actually not going to pay attention to it. Um, the ordering scale, and then there's, there's a hoarding scale. And what you can see is that there are, you know, quite significant differences between folks with OCD and these other groups when it comes to these other validated uh, subscales. But when it comes to hoarding, there's no significant difference between OCD folks and the anxious controls and the students, you know, or the students. So hoarding is not able to really differentiate between these, these groups of people. This is just another, another study that we did using the very same methodology. Here we didn't even use the neutralizing scale because of its uh, problems with psychometric properties. And again, here, the green uh, bars back here, different perspective too. Uh, these are the folks with OCD. Significant differences between all of these other uh, uh, groups on these other subscales, but no significant differences when it came to hoarding. So in two studies, hoarding symptoms are no different in folks with OCD than they are in people with other anxiety disorders and even uh, undergraduate students. We went further and we looked at uh, intercorrelations between the different measures of uh, the, the different OCD uh, symptoms. And you would expect that if the, these disorder, the, if these symptoms are all part of the same disorder, you would expect them to intercorrelate with one another. And for the most part, they do fairly strongly, but hoarding, you can see there were no significant, I'm sorry, they're all uh, statistically significant, but nothing above 0.4 and the uh, highest correlation, uh, 0.35, so fairly weak 
uh, correlations for hoarding and these other uh, obsessive compulsive symptoms. Again, more evidence that these symptoms are you know, probably different from these other symptoms of OCD. And what about, we know that OCD is associated with depression and anxiety. Um, this is a large group actually of students who completed these measures, so actually not very strong correlations overall. They completed the Beck Depression Inventory and the Self-Rated Anxiety Scale. And you can see we found significant correlations for the most part between the other OCD symptoms and depression and anxiety, but hoarding was barely at all associated with depression and anxiety. Again, seems like it's a, a, a different uh, symptom than the other OCD symptoms. These data, so we also looked at how well the prevalence, uh, I'm sorry, the presence of hoarding and other OCD symptoms uh, could, could discriminate people with OCD from college students, from undergraduate students. And so receiver operating uh, curve analysis uses the association between the sensitivity and the specificity um, to indicate how well scores on a certain measure distinguish between positive and negative cases. Positive being they have OCD, negative in this case being that they are uh, students. And what, what happens is that a value of one, as you get closer to a value of one for the area under the curve, so that would be kind of between the diagonal and each of these curves, as you get closer to one, that indicates perfect diagnostic precision of the, of the measure here of the obsessive compulsive inventory subscale. And when you have uh, an area under the curve of 0.5, that indicates chance, random. So we conducted ROC analysis for the OCIR subscales to determine how well they distinguished OCD patients from, from students here, and then also from people with other anxiety disorders. And what you can see is that the, the subscale was, the area under the curve was significant for each of the subscales, except not for hoarding. Hoarding was unable to distinguish between people with OCD and, and students. And in this study is, um, uh, there's, I'm just magnifying the bar there and showing that to you. And then here, with um, people with other anxiety disorders, again, the same result. Hoarding was not able to discriminate any better than chance, whereas these other uh, subscales uh, were able to discriminate between OCD and people with other anxiety disorders. So some conclusions about uh, OCD and hoarding. There doesn't seem to be much strong evidence in, in our research or in a number of other studies that have been done, a number of them having been published just over the last year. Um, not a lot of strong evidence supporting hoarding as a specific symptom of OCD. Um, some people with OCD, as we talked about before, may display some hoarding uh, that are, that's related to their obsessional doubts, uh, but um, by and large, I would conclude that hoarding is not uh, a part of OCD, and so it's a good move to take that out of OCD and have a new hoarding disorder. I don't, I don't know if hoarding is an anxiety disorder or something else. We'll leave that to the DSM uh, committees to debate. And finally, I want to talk about hypochondriasis, uh, which I often refer to as, as health anxiety. Uh, and is this uh, an anxiety disorder? Should it be moved from the uh, somatoform disorders uh, into uh, the anxiety disorders in DSM-5? So the main uh, central features of, of hypochondriasis are that they involve a, it involves a preoccupation with the fear of having some sort of serious disease like cancer, and it persists despite the fact that the person has gotten you know, repeated uh, evaluations, tests, reassurance from, from their, their physicians, um, and it leads to repetitive checking with doctors. So they're always going back, you know, can I have one more test? Can you just tell me what this symptoms mean? What this symptom means? Or they're going on the internet to check for information, to try to gain reassurance. That sore throat, is that from, you know, talking for an hour, or is that because I'm developing throat cancer or something like that? Now, hypochondriasis shares some overlapping features with uh, both panic and, and OCD from a uh, more or less typo topographical uh, standpoint. Um, what about with panic disorder? Well, both involve extensive medical utilization. People with panic disorder are often uh, calling doctors. They first usually go to um, uh, physicians in emergency rooms before they're going to mental health professionals because they feel like they've got uh, a medical condition. Um, same thing, obviously, with, with hypochondriasis. And they both involve a focus on somatic cues. There's a lot of hypervigilance to body sensations, right? Is it happening now? Kind of monitoring what's going on inside their body. And um, 